You've hit play on the Screen Companion, a show about making your viewing time count. This episode, my friends Max and Andrew join me in giving recommendations for first-timers to the James Bond series. The films have been around since 1962 and are understandably daunting to newcomers. Where does one start? At the beginning? We don't think so. Once you start, are you now committed to finishing all 25-plus films? Of course not. Take it one movie at a time, and maybe one good watch is all you really need. So forget the Mammoth franchise, and let's focus on three Bond flicks we think might be up your alley. Tomorrow Never Dies, From Russia With Love, and The Living Daylights. Three very different versions from three different decades starring three different actors as James Bond. In gearing up for this discussion, I asked my guests to select a single 30 minute or less chunk from their respective movies for us to watch in order to demonstrate their reasons for picking them. The chosen segments had to be uninterrupted and couldn't include the ending because really, we'd like you to go see these movies for yourselves and enjoy. First up, Tomorrow Never Dies from 1997, starring Pierce Brosnan as Bond in his second performance as the character. Andrew, why did you pick it? The reason why I went with Tomorrow Never Dies is because it's more classic Bond villain where it's an over-the-top plot to mess with the world. He's ridiculously overacting. I watched it yesterday and I really forgot how weird it can get. God damn it, I love it. When you say overacting, are you talking about Pierce Brosnan or Jonathan Price? I'm talking about Jonathan Price. Perhaps with all your jetting around, you have not had a chance to peruse today's headlines. I rather like the last one. I never believe what I read in the press anyway. Uh, therein lies your problem, Mr. Bond. Words are the new weapons. Satellites, the new artillery. And you become the new supreme allied commander? Exactly. Caesar had his legions, Napoleon had his armies. I have my divisions. TV, news, magazines. And by midnight tonight, I'll have reached and influenced more people than anyone in the history of this planet, save God himself. And the best he ever managed was a Sermon on the Mount. Oh, you really are quite insane. The distance between insanity and genius is measured only by success. There are a few Bond movies that I consider to be, uh, air quotes here, the art house Bond films, and GoldenEye's one of them. So Pierce played that a little more seriously. Tomorrow Never Dies, he added more of like the Roger Moore jokey feeling to it. But he does it well. Like he has a good, he has that good comedic timing, and luckily it's not over the top like the Roger Moore movies. But yeah, Jonathan Price is just, he is hamming it up in the best way. Oh yeah, he's one of the best parts of the whole thing. I feel like if you enjoy Tomorrow Never Dies, if you go online and look up what are the best Bond movies, Tomorrow Never Dies is usually going to be near the bottom, at least from what I've seen. So that's why I think if you like this one, you'll be able to enjoy the other ones easily. The really, really good ones are going to be that much more of a treat. Casino Royale or GoldenEye or... Even, you know, like From Russia With Love and The Living Daylights, you'll enjoy the artistry of those movies more than I think you would have if you started with them and then tried to work with the other ones. Max, do you like Tomorrow Never Dies? So it's been a while since I actually saw the whole film, and I remember at the time I was thinking to myself, this is a bit much, like, it's a little over the top. But now that I'm older and rewatching the clip from the recommendations, I was like, well... This is actually kind of fun and goofy in its own way. This isn't bad at all, if you look at it from a different perspective. It's hard to imagine uh, Tomorrow Never Dies being polarizing, because as I was watching the clip, it struck me that Tomorrow Never Dies is probably similar to a lot of other movies in the series. That's the average. Yeah, it's a lot more like the classic Connery's and Roger Moore movies because of the scale of it and how silly it can get. With Tomorrow Never Dies, you have Elliot Carver, who's just kind of 
William Randolph Hearst turned up to, you know, 11 with satellites. And the reason why he's doing it is just ratings. Like, he just wants to be that guy. It's very crazy. But also a big part of the reason, I, and at full disclosure, it's the first Bond movie that I'd ever seen in theaters. And so it is a pretty big nostalgia trip for me. The intro of that film is one of the best intros in a Bond movie ever. So you're talking about the Terrorist Arms Bazaar. It's just explosions and guns and mayhem, and it's stylish. And so I really liked it. He just punches a dude in the face for smoking, and then just starts throwing grenades everywhere. <laughs> Did he need to punch that guy in order to complete his mission? No. He could have walked away, but that guy, I guess, could have shot him in the back, so you might as well just knock him out now. He was like a lone guard, like, out in the middle. He definitely could have hindered his mission. It's like, hey, who's that guy just wandering to the camp? Go bug him. See what's going on. It looked pretty small to be a arms bazaar. But it's a terrorist arms bazaar, so, I mean, how often do they congregate in big groups like that? Maybe they're, uh, they're bidding remotely. Perhaps. But there were a lot of dudes to kill, and Pierce got about half of them. So, missing from those first 30 minutes is Michelle Yeoh as the Bond girl, who is great, because she, I think, is the first Bond girl who is not completely useless. Wait a second, though. What about Pussy Galore? She wasn't very useless. She wasn't useless, but she definitely was not, I'll say, a go-getter on her own. She kind of needed to be... Persuaded? Sexually persuaded to do what Bond wanted her to do. She wasn't a self-starter, I guess. I, I think useless is the wrong word, maybe, but... She took on a more active role. How's that? Yeah. Yeah, she was much more... She was kind of like the female Bond, in a sense. Like, it's just she was capable, she was savvy, she's got her, you know, kung fu sequence because she's a great martial arts actress too and she's just she's just good at her job just like james is oh and she uh doesn't try to sleep with bond until what the very end the very end yeah that's the measure of a bond girl that's capable is that she doesn't sleep with him too soon the mission was over and then she starts she, you know what I'll, i'm gonna enjoy myself now she's not your average tinder date exactly I think to your point about it being a good middle-of-the-road Bond movie, uh, something I noticed from the first half hour, it's got plenty of action, suspense, quips, all hallmarks of the series. The, uh, the credit sequence is pretty good. Not the greatest, but it's, it's fine. <laughs> the 3D stuff. <laughs> it's a little dated. They're all dated, dude. They're all dated when you go back and watch them. No, yeah, but something about this one, when I was watching, it's like, holy crap, is this running, like, on a PS2, or what's going on here? The, well, I mean, yeah, it's definitely, it's definitely late 90s uh, CG, man. Probably would have blown my mind back at the time, if I actually watched it in theaters, too. Max, what was your first theater bond? Oh, God, it was, uh, Skyfall. Wow. Dude... The fifth season of The Screen Companion begins September 1st, 2024. Having trouble waiting months for its return? Watch out for a special Doctor Who retrospective, re-examining all of Christopher Eccleston's episodes as The Doctor. But warning to casual listeners and enjoyers of pop culture, we're going to get real geeky. The Doctor Who Series 1 show will help fill the gap, releasing everywhere The Screen Companion does, on May 1st. Now, back to the show. Tomorrow Never Dies has an over-the-top villain, an outrageous plot where you don't want to ask questions. As long as you don't ask questions, you're going to have a good time. Yeah, it's not a thinking man's bond. It's just, do you want to watch a slick action movie with every hallmark of the series? It really does have everything that the series is known for shoved into one movie. I think if you can like that one, even if you don't think it's this 10 out of 10 experience, 
I think you can watch that one if you enjoyed it. You can say, all right, well, I'll dive into this, continue with the series. Maybe I'll watch the other Pierce Brosnan ones. There are other movies in the series that are narratively and just technically, even like from a filmmake, just a filmmaking perspective, done better. Let's go back for a second. Max, you said Skyfall was your first Bond in the theater. Did you like Bond before then? What took you so long to see it at a theater? Honestly, it was just maybe money and laziness. Didn't really spend much time actually going to theaters because kind of like, oh, it's a whole adventure. Leaving the house, having, what, $10 at the time to go in and go watch it. And the only reason why I watched it then was because out in Pasadena, there's like a $2 movie theater. We can watch movies just as they're at the tail end of their showings. And the place where you can um, studios can just get squeeze those last few dollars out of you before they pull it out. And that's the only reason why, why I went out and actually watched it. Let's suppose that somebody does take your recommendation, Andrew. They watch Tomorrow Never Dies. They love it. They're into it. What's your second pick then? I think you know, actually I might go with Skyfall because that one's also, I think, another perfect mix of old and new. Oh, that feels a little like whiplash to go from Jonathan Price to Javier Bardem. There are a lot of different types of villains in the series. You know, like with Jonathan Price's villain, I mean, really the only comparable one I can think of in terms of how wacky and over the top. Well, there's the guy from Die Another Day. And then there's the guy, oh, sorry, not the guy, Christopher Walken from A View to a Kill. He's way over the top. Well, I guess I guess Skyfall is a good choice because that's also one you don't want to ask too many questions. And Bardem is playing it pretty broad at times, so there's some Jonathan Price DNA in there. Yeah, he hams it up quite a bit. The Screen Companion is available on multiple platforms, including Podbean, Amazon Music Podcast, Spotify, YouTube, and Rumble. Tell us your review, vote for what we should cover next, or let certain guests know they're your favorite via the Screen Companion at gmail.com or by posting on the Screen Companion group on Facebook. Thanks to everyone in the States and abroad for listening. Further support the host by purchasing his novel, Traversal, The Weight of Worlds, available in both digital and print formats on Amazon.com. Let's switch gears and talk about From Russia with Love. Max, how did you arrive at that one? I remember trying to go through them in order. It's like, all right, I'll look up, see which one's supposed to be the first one. Dr. No, let's do it. And Dr. No is a no for me. It's not a bad film, but kind of boring and not what I was looking for. It's definitely slow. And what's the gist of From Russia with Love's plot? plot is, hey, we're going to set up this trap for Bond. Even MI6 is like, yeah, this is definitely a trap. Still, though, we want that cipher. Go get it, Bond. Really simple plot. You can follow it from beginning to end, no problem. I feel like For Much With Love definitely has all that stuff that brings up all the fun spy stuff, while still kind of keeping it leveled and, you know, down to earth. This is it. This is the one. This is where everything that sets Bond up is from. Q branch has put together a smart-looking piece of luggage for us. We're issuing this to all 00 personnel. An ordinary black leather case with 20 rounds of ammunition here and here. Flat throwing knife. Press that button there. Now she comes. Inside the case, you'll find an AR-7 folding sniper's rifle, .25 caliber, with an infrared telescopic sight. Now watch very carefully. An ordinary tin of talcum powder. Inside, a tear gas cartridge. That goes in the case against the side here like that. You got it? Yes, I think so. Is that all, sir? Yes, thanks very much. Right. Job. Well, something I notice is how amazing that first half hour of From Russia With Love is all set up. No action except for the very beginning. Yeah, the, the whole little fake-out scene where it's like, oh, there's just these two guys playing a game of cat and mouse. Then you find out it's Bond, but not really. It was a mask. Bond doesn't show up until about 20 minutes into it. Can anybody think of any other movies in the series where it takes that long for Bond to appear? Doctor No. 
He doesn't come in for a while on Dr. No, but I don't know if it's 20 minutes. He shows up, like, in some casino scene, doesn't he? Isn't that his first? Yeah, I think that's when you first see him, yeah. If people like From Russia With Love, what's the next movie you think they should watch? I don't know. I feel like Goldfinger, for me, was like a close second. It's one of the best in the series. The other movie that's on this list also probably would be pretty good, too. Just from the clip that I saw, I actually want to give it a full watch now. Perfect segue into the final movie. The Living Daylight, 1987, Timothy Dalton, The Man. Andrew, haven't you said before that License to Kill is your favorite? Of the Dalton movies or just in general? I thought you said in general. No, it's not my absolute favorite, but it is my favorite of the Dalton movies. Not to say that I don't like The Living Daylights at all. Both Timothy Dalton movies are top-tier 007 films. What separates License to Kill for me is there's more action to it. It's the first PG-13 Bond film. It's different than the other movies. It's a revenge movie. It's not a spy thriller. It's just Bond trying to get revenge, really. The Living Daylights is a great, great espionage and spy type movie. I don't want to say it's necessarily hard to follow, but you can't zone out of it. You know what I mean? Like, you really have to pay attention. Oh, yeah. I had to watch it three times before I really understood the plot. There's a lot going on. There's moments of character development and stuff like that where, you know, you can just kind of watch that. But then the next thing you know, within like two or three minutes, there's just plot and plot, 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 plot coming at you real fast. And if you kind of drop your attention for a little bit, you might miss something crucial and something else won't make sense down the line. I can actually vouch for this because I watched one action scene, went to like the briefing with M and I was like, all right, I'll pause it real quick. Go get some food. Come back. It only takes like five minutes to go get food. I unpaused it. I was like, wait, what the hell happened? Well, what's different with my pick and the segment I wanted to look at versus you guys's is mine does not begin the movie. It starts about half hour into it. And the reason why I did that is because I think The Living Daylights is a good movie for people to start with if you really want to like Bond. When he's a little less sadistic, a little less of a womanizer. He's the opposite of a Sean Connery in some of his earlier movies. So there's no woman beating is what I'm hearing. No, no woman beating. Roger Moore slapped him around too. Whereas Sean Connery just wants to use him and lose him. Yeah, he gets a little rough and tumble with the ladies. So with as convoluted as Living Daylights gets... I had to think for a second to really distill it into something simple. And what it comes down to is Bond has to stop an arms dealer from going through with an opium deal to help fund terrorism. And then it made me realize, oh, both of Dalton's movies are about drugs. The war on drugs. I don't know if that's how I would define it, though. I don't want to spoil the movie for people who watch it, but like that opium deal thing, you don't really learn about it until the last 40 minutes. Oh yeah, that just goes to show how many twists and turns, many more than they should have, happened in this movie. But at the end of the day, that's really the meat and potatoes, and then everything else just kind of exists around it, such as a defecting Russian general. Now let's understand one another, Bond. General Koskov is a top KGB mastermind. His defection is my baby. He contacted me. I've planned this out to the last detail. You'll want the soft-nosed ones, I expect. No, the steel tipped. KGB snipers usually wear body armor. Koskov is under intensive KGB surveillance. A sniper has been assigned to watch him, and he expressly asked for you to protect him. Why me? He's under the impression you're the best. And that's the first part of my clip, which is the henchman named Necros is going to retrieve this defector that, in the beginning of the movie, Bond helped escape. I love that scene because it shows Necros fighting with a security guy in the kitchen, 
just grounds everything and brings some humanity to the characters. Because you almost think the security guy could win. Who's this guy pretending like he's a hitman? Gets caught halfway through stashing the body? Throws a pot of hot water at a guy? Necros picks up a rolling pin at one point and uses it menacingly. Yeah, no, he's using the whole kitchen and everything he can within his reach. I just love how, how domestic it gets. Alright, so that whole milkman get-up thing, though, that's what kind of got me for a little while. Yes, that too. He's dressed as a milkman. I was like, wait, they would never let a milkman go on premise to this place where they're keeping this guy secure? Then he grabs exploding milk bottles and just ruins the house. If they didn't have exploding milk bottles, we would say it was a waste of his disguise. Probably, yeah. After that scene at the safe house, which by the way, Necros does retrieve the defector, so he does undo Bond's victory from the beginning of the movie, and it's a big setback for Bond to overcome. Uh, we go a couple scenes ahead to Kara, the Bond girl. She's a musician. She's practicing. Bond sits in the audience and watches her. And I think this is where he starts to fall in love. I never really read into it too much on that. I didn't feel like he really started getting feels until later in the movie. Because he's clearly using this broad. Yeah, from the little bit that I saw, I thought it was more of a, oh, I'm just watching her and keeping tabs on her until something happens. The way she played the role was also just over-the-top naivete, where she was kind of like, oh, James, you know, like, everything was an oh, James moment. I think later I can say, like, yeah, this was one of the Bond girls he fell for later in the movie, but at the beginning, I didn't. when she was playing, I didn't really think too much of that. A lot to this plot, when they first meet, she doesn't know everything about him. Part of why I think Dalton's Bond is a more approachable guy, a nicer guy, I started to think about what he wasn't doing in his interactions with her. Andrew, if she had met Sean Connery's Bond, do you think he would have been as patient with her? No, but I also am trying to remember how he treated the woman in From Russia With Love. Although she was supposed to be playing him, ultimately he was playing her. But I don't remember him doing it in a mean way, but maybe one of those like chauvinist, dismissive ways. So yeah, I don't think that Sean Connery or Roger Moore would have been as, I'll say, tender. He definitely like he was definitely a lot nicer to her. So yeah, I I can't see it working with another with the other Bonds. I think that Timothy Dalton is the best actor who has played James Bond. He had the chops for the role definitely and. In particular, that film. If we move ahead to that wonderful car chase, Bond and Kara trying to get to the Austrian border. Because she doesn't know that he's a secret agent, he's using all these spy gadgets on his car. And I just get such happy feeling from seeing her befuddled, constantly asking him, what's that? What's this missile? Why do you have this attachment? And he just, he smiles and humors her instead of telling her to shut the hell up. And then at the very end of that scene where they're crossing into Austria and they're using the cello case, I can't imagine Daniel Craig Bond willing to make himself look that foolish by writing in that thing. So, Max, what about the part that you saw for this discussion spoke to you the most as far as being one you'd want to check out? It's probably the scene when Bond makes contact with the girl and it's like, we're going to bring you back over to the other side. That whole part of the KGB is after you. I want to find out more about why. Very from Russia with love. Yeah, also probably a little bit from the first scene too, of like KGB agent with exploding milk. Tell me more about this guy. There are definitely some silly parts to it that feel like a holdover from when it was a Roger Moore script. Well, I'm glad they adapted it to Timothy Dalton a little bit more instead of trying to shoehorn into that wacky Bond. I can pick up and watch Goldfinger, the Daniel Craig Bonds. I can pick those up at almost any time to watch them. 
the Roger Moore Bonds, I do have to be in a mood because they are they do get so silly, especially something like The Man with the Golden Gun, which is not very well regarded, but I love it. That's not my Bond. The Roger Moore movies, as good as they can be, I'd say they're more of an acquired taste. I'd say for you, Max, you know, since you first started in theaters with Daniel Craig, you know, Sean Connery is pretty serious. And then you skipped all the way to Pierce Brosnan, especially with Goldeneye, it's pretty serious. Moore's pretty consistent, though, all the way through his seven movies. I, I have to say, he's, I've never considered him a bad Bond. Yeah, the Roger Moore movies are their own thing for sure, and at times they can border too much on comedy for my taste. Assuming you like Living Daylights, I think a good follow-up, if you want a Bond that you can like as a person, not that I always need to love my uh, protagonist, I think Goldeneye would be a good second one. Because in that one, they also put a mirror up to his character and some of the misogyny of dealing with a female M. It all uh, delves further into making him a bit more of a human character. I don't remember that part. I don't know. I, I was probably paying more attention to, like, I don't know, some of the stuff I saw in the game and, oh, action, fun. Well, how about that scene on the beach between him and his love interest? He was a friend, Trevelyan. And now he's your enemy and you will kill him. It is that simple. In a word, yes. Unless he kills you first. I tell you. You think I'm impressed? All of you with your guns, your killing, your death, for what? So you can be a hero? All the heroes I know are dead. Tell you, listen to me. How can you act like this? How can you be so cold? It's what keeps me alive. No. It's what keeps you alone. That part I remember. If you had to pick a second one, Andrew, what do you think is a good one to show some of Bond's vulnerabilities? Casino Royale is pretty great. That one, he gets vulnerable. I am hesitant to say that one because I think that's one of the best ones that's ever been made. So I feel like I'd be shooting that shot early because, like, you know, when it comes to the quality, I want people to watch the best ones last. So, Max, Skyfall is the most recent one that you've seen. Are you going to check out No Time to Die? I'm kind of hesitant until I actually watch the other films first. I almost wonder if it's all that important to watch the other ones, even though they are connected in some way, but more and more with these franchise movies, I think they make it as accessible as possible so that if it was your first Spawn movie, you could watch it. I don't know about that. It seems like a lot of stuff in Spectre is going to matter. I think after Spectre, I got cooled off on Bond. I don't think I'm going to watch No Time to Die. Really? Spectre was such a uh, sad film for me as an audience member that I almost want to imagine Craig's last movie as Skyfall and just end it there until maybe the next guy takes over. I will admit that Spectre was a pretty big disappointment for me too, but I I think with No Time to Die, what's kind of keeping me moving, because I thought the trailer looked pretty good. I like the guy that they got to direct it. I'm looking forward to it. I'm not pinning on my hopes on it as being as good as Casino or Skyfall, but I am hoping it's going to be better than Spectre. I'm at least expecting it to be as good as Quantum of Solace. Quantum's actually my favorite out of the Daniel Craig's. Really? It's a tight movie. From beginning to end, it just plays through, and the love interest there doesn't bite it. And she's one of the few ones not to have sex with Bond, so... That was cool. You're kind of giving me a reason to watch all of the Daniel Craig version. Overall, he has a pretty good hit percentage. Mm-hmm. I mean, really, Spectre's his only stinker. I wouldn't necessarily call it a bad movie, it's just when you compare it to, I think, the other Daniel Craig's, it really falls short, but it is better than other Bond films. 
Where in the pantheon of Bonds do you think Spectre lies? It's very middle of the road for me. It's above Octopussy and For Your Eyes Only. I wasn't the biggest fan of Thunderball. Oh, you want to talk about where Bond really comes off like a jerk? That's Thunderball. Yeah, he's an ass in that movie. So go watch it, Max. <laughs> Next time your friend or significant other badgers you to watch a James Bond movie, go ahead and take the reins. And select Tomorrow Never Dies if you want a fun romp. From Russia with love for that Cold War espionage, or the living daylights for a more likable portrayal of the classic British secret agent.